hello booktube oh. <laughs> well as you can see it's manatee monday no matter what the calendar says <laughs> and we have a guest <laughs> oh introduce your baby mrs d lucky oh. he, he's a sweet he's a sweet pup <laughs> but he doesn't understand zoom calls I'm glad that uh, that you thought to do that because uh, Frida is nowhere to be found in this video. So at least they get a cute dog, a cute puppy. I am no. I am up in Vermont, so I'm not at Hyde, Hyde Cottage. And Frida is here, of course, but she's out of camera range. <laughs> Are there other dogs there? No, there are two cats. Oh, how does she like that? She doesn't, <laughs> and they don't like her. But it's it's a it's, it's an uneasy detente. They don't go after each other anymore. They oh, did good. In the first few times that she, we came up here, they they would go after her and she would go on, you know, DEFCON 5 alert if one of them even came into view. Now they can be in easy view of each other and not go nuts. Yeah, Lucky does not like cats at all. No, one yeah. of them's bigger than Frida. <laughs> she doesn't know what to make of them. She knows they're not dogs. Uh-huh. But she also, so she can't boss them around, but she also knows they're not mice, so she can't attack them. So she doesn't know what to do with them. They don't fit into any category. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what Lucky would do if he ever caught a cat. But one time, so my upstairs neighbors um, sometimes leave their door open and the cats come down and they sit in front of our apartment door and Lucky can smell them. So he barks at them. And one time he got out of my apartment and he raced upstairs and their apartment door was open and he chased their cats like all around the all around the apartment like you know the circular hallway and um you know the cat was faster and smarter so it's but. kind of odd though isn't it if you have if you have cats and you know that they're willing to wander why would you leave your door open i mean why would you leave your door open anyway well i mean we don't have a, a large apartment building and I mean, there's really no problem with the cats, you know, coming down, um, coming down the stairs. It's like not like they're going to get out, um, out of the building. But they don't. I don't think they do it as often as they used to. <laughs> After like he ran upstairs and started chasing them. Well, so shall we adhere to the rigid structure? Yes. Manatee Monday. Yes, let's do so. <laughs> so and starting with my aches and pains. Yes. What are your aches and pains this time around? My ache and pain is the the thing that it's often been, which is sleep. Because I'm going through another little bout of insomnia, and um, it's just it's just painful. It's life wrecking. I've heard. It's it, just it life wrecking. It's very, yeah. Um, Do you have any idea what causes it? Does it line up to anything going on in your life or what you're eating? I think it's or? just general anxiety, you know, because um, the night before last, I was ready to go to sleep. It was like 4 a.m. or whatever. And I finally felt tired. I finally felt like, okay, I can sleep. And, and put my head down on the pillow and all of a sudden every, you know, questionable aspect of my future and the world and you know life in general just round and round and round so i don't know i don't know why it could be anxiety it, it and it's much easier to sleep during the day and i don't know why that is either like i don't know why that level of anxiety ramps up at night as, as i'm sure it does for a lot of people and like maybe because you mean, can't would a solution be just to swap your sleeping time and sleep during the day if that's when it happens? Well, well, that's kind of what I've been doing, but it's really inconvenient, hmm. you know? Um, like, as you know, we have tried to schedule this Zoom call for days and days and days. And Since Monday. Every day, I, every day I type Steve like around like noon or one o'clock. I'm like, I can't do it today. I'm just so tired, you know, cause I'm just, you know, waking up but i've only had a few hours sleep so i don't know i don't know what it is does it show any sign of ending um last night was pretty good i i didn't it was four o'clock when i went to sleep but i went to sleep and i woke up 
I think at 10 this morning and I felt rested. So when this happens to you, does it tend to have to last a certain set amount of time and then all of a sudden it goes away? It never goes away, but it will go worse and then mm -hmm. it will come back to where it is He's like so last cute. night. Where, <laughs> where it will be like three, three or four in the morning that I'll fall asleep. But then when I wake up, I feel rested. Mm. Whereas the bad times, it's like, I don't sleep at all until after the sun rises. And then I'm just miserable for the rest of the day. So I don't know. I don't, I, and this is not, this has not been a lifelong problem with me. This has cropped up in the last few years. So oh. Well, as you know, my ache and pain is never going to be sleep related, <laughs> unfortunately. Now, what is your sleep schedule? Because you stay up late reading. Yeah, I barely sleep at all. And I don't miss but you it. don't sleep very much. No, so I, I, I don't know what it's like. But I've known people who experience this, including some people who don't even have the guess of anxiety where I, they tell me I am perfectly content and I still can't sleep. I'm perfectly content and I exercise and I still can't sleep. And it drives them nuts. So I, I sympathize completely. <laughs> no, my ache and pain has to do with where I am. I am in Vermont and this week it has been unearthly cold. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this week, and I mean, it has been in Boston too. But, but it's always Vermont, colder out of the city. It's been unbelievable. Yeah. Just un last night it was 15 below zero. Holy cow. And for once, I don't need to clarify that for our European listeners because it's still 15 below zero. It's, 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 just, a, it's just 15 degrees below zero. It was unbelievable. The type of thing where you take a step out. I took a step out the back door to take Frida for one last walk of the evening. And you take your first step outside the warmth of the house and you think, oh, this isn't that bad. And two steps later, you feel like you're on the edge of outer space. I mean, you, you, you go up to Maine, so you know what I'm, gonna what, I'm, what I'm mentioning here. There is one side benefit, which is that when you look up, you see a night full of stars. Yes. Unbelievable what getting away from the city will do for that yeah. view. But I'm not as much interested in a, a beautiful view of night stars if I feel like I'm seeing them from outside the U.S. space station, <laughs> where, where I'm just sort of in open, in open vacuum. I don't want to see them clearly in that circumstance so, so it's not really an ache and pain it's just I, I mean Frida doesn't like walking in this she doesn't like standing on the freezing ground like this she uh-huh I have to be <laughs> look at his little face I have to be careful of her yeah put a little pause up you can say you can oh, listen too hi baby oh <laughs> and but, he's pretty shaggy right now so he's he's okay in the cold um, but he doesn't like the salt that they You're put You're kind of shaggy the yourself, Mrs. D. I am very when shaggy. You I desperately need a haircut. <laughs> I desperately need a haircut. That is true. And then one of them can put you in a, in a headlock while the other one trims your nails. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen the weather for uh, the weekend in Boston? You were the first person I thought of. We're supposed to get a storm, right? Yeah. And is it supposed to, I like a huge nor'easter? Two of the models of the projection models say that Boston is going to get 12 to 15 inches of snow and massive gusts of wind up to 50 <laughs> miles an hour. Lucky didn't like hearing that. But the European model, uh, which is often right, as weather forecasters say, you discount the European model at your peril. The European model says that Boston is going to get 40 inches of snow and have wind gusts up to 70 miles an hour, which is borderline hurricane. You better hope that doesn't happen. <laughs> I don't suspect it will. It looks like, it, weirdly enough, it looks like this storm is going to be stronger the closer you get to the coast. So I'm pretty sure that, that we're going to skate right through it here in Vermont, which is usually hit much harder than Boston. So we shall see. I can't. I'm keeping my eye on it all day long. The models keep changing all day long. And my relatives in Maine will just be laughing, being being like, you call that snow? <laughs> yes, yes. 12 inches, man, that's nothing. <laughs> but are you ready? Do you have all of your emergency supplies of books? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll be, I'll be fine. <laughs> right, well, what about your story? What's your story this time around? 
So, so for those of you who are new to Manatee Monday, Deb and I like to meet across the back fence and just swap stories like Donegal housewives. <laughs> and just swap stories. So my story today is Twitter. Is, are, are three things that I've seen on Twitter, two I'm totally sick of and one nice. And I'll start with the ones I'm sick of. I'm sick of hearing people talking about NFTs. I don't know what they are. <laughs> and I'm sure I don't care about them. So I hate any mention of them in my timeline. Um, the second thing is banning books. Like you see that. There, there have been book bannings of uh, Mouse. A Tennessee County. And a uh, 10 to zero decision. 10 people, all 10 people, it was unanimous to ban is, a, a graphic novel about the Holocaust. Which is just ridiculous. Yeah. And it happens only 10 days after a, a local lawmaker said, I forget where it was, I hope it wasn't Tennessee or we have a real problem. A local lawmaker said that, that teachers in his county need to show a balanced approach when they're teaching about Nazi Germany, <laughs> about the Holocaust. They need to be, there needs to be a balanced approach to teaching. <sighs> and sales of mouse, of course, have, have skyrocketed. Good. So that went viral on Twitter, but those are both awful. What's the good thing? The good thing is um, I read something, I think my roommate sent me this, something about um, there, there was someone that died, a, a book lover who died, and they put out her books at her funeral or wake or, or whatever, so that people could take away a little piece of her. And awful. I thought that was lovely. And I that think is lovely. I think that's going into my plans. That is lovely. That's a great I'm, idea. I do that myself, but I'm 28, so it's a long way off. Yeah, you don't have to worry about it. I don't for have to think a about it for a long time. No, no. But I think that would be a great idea. Um, of course, I don't know anyone that likes to read, so I don't know who would take these books. If I Maybe were some that, of my main relatives to throw on the fire. Yes. You know, those stoke things up in the winter a little bit. It. And if, if I were to do that, if I were to pop my clogs before you do, and I did mm -hmm. that as part of my plan, could could I also give away you? <laughs> would, so, would someone at the funeral get you? <laughs> I would love that. If you could find a taker, I'd be, I'd be aboard. <laughs> Well, I, when you mentioned NFTs, I'm reminded of a story. Julian Lennon, John Lennon's son, recently agreed to an auction, to auctioning off some of his father's memorabilia. Mm -hmm. And my first thought was, okay, well, he needs money. And then, then the story went on. The second paragraph of the story is that he's, he's, auto, he's auctioning off NFTs of his father's memorabilia. <laughs> Not the memorabilia at all. The memorabilia isn't going anywhere. <laughs> he's, he's selling nfts of the memorabilia and he'll make a killing because he's because the the internet is insane he'll make a killing without losing anything <laughs> holy shit well my my story is uh yes. purely negative uh because nothing will come of it it would be purely positive if anything did i don't know if you saw it, it, it's a name that's come up on my story many times on manatee monday madison cawthorn oh, the, the openly okay. fascist the openly nazi uh, congressman uh, who adamantly claims that he loves America <laughs> while wearing, you know, Nazi uniform. Uh, he, there's a, a movement afoot in his state to ban him from running for office because mm -hmm. there is a, a, a provision in the U.S. Constitution that, that was done, of course, after the American Civil War that said, if you have participated in open sedition against the government, you can't run for office again. And apparently the, the movement in his district is getting some traction. People are saying, this is right there in the constitution. You can't run for office again because you have, you were, you have been consistently a vocal advocate of violently overthrowing the government. So you can't be in the government if that's the case. I, I saw that and I thought, okay, well, you're not gonna act on it, first of all. You, you don't have the strength of your convictions even when someone is as openly evil as mm -hmm. he is. And, but then I thought, okay, well, but we know the name of two dozen people that, uh, who are in Congress right now and one ex-president mm -hmm. who are every bit as guilty. They're every bit as guilty yes. of that. And the provision is right there to stop them from running for office again. They're all going to run for office again in 2024. When 
it's not legal for them to do so. <laughs> so so, so it, it's just one of those, my, my story is one of those endlessly frustrating things. <laughs> That's all. There's no, yes, that is very frustrating. We should just move right on to books. Books are never frustrating, are they? I have never met a frustrating book. Both of my books this time are frustrating, but, but, but I'll make the best of them. What is yours? What's your what, book? No, why don't you go first? You always make me go first. And oh. I know I'm a lady and... You yeah, know, you're a lady. Old fashioned sexist dichotomies apply at Manatee Monday. <laughs> All right, well, I'll go first. Uh, yeah. Because I'm a lady too. <laughs> I've, I've uh, come, I've had a, you, you know, when you go somewhere else, when you're not at home, tons and tons mm -hmm. of books come your way. I brought a bunch of books up here and I knew already I was going to have access to tons of, I was going to ignore the books I brought up here. So uh, I found some books out in the barn <laughs> and, I, and I also got some books. We went out book buying. And uh, the two that I want to show today are frustrating in different ways. Uh, the first okay. one is this thing. It's the Faber book of letters. Oh, I love books of letters. It's a little anthology, why, why? A, a collection of letters. And I usually love collections of letters too, but this one was not good. Really? That's the first letter collection I've ever read that wasn't good. It's, uh, and, it's strictly and, chronological, first of all which means that you're getting mm -hmm. the very earliest letters at the beginning of the book and without any relief, you know, right. so it doesn't mix things up. So for the first 300 pages, you've got 18th century language and 18th right. century concerns with no footnotes or almost none. So that you're, you're just sort of slogging along. And then when you get to the modern letters, the editor, who is the editor, Felix Pryor, the editor, includes all kinds of things that I wouldn't have included. First of all, he has a penchant for including extremely long letters. Well, that's not what you want in a letter anthology. You don't want them all to be like that. And he includes right. people writing letters to the editor, people writing letters to their financial managers. I think maybe his goal was to show us the variety of letters, but he, he himself, he starts the first line of his introduction to this book is most letters are boring. Well, if you start your introduction off that way, I like to assume that means you're not going to go on to prove that. <laughs> you know, you, you're, you're going to leave the boring ones out, but he doesn't. This was, I paid 25 cents for it, but it, it, it isn't a good letter anthology. If you ever see this in a used bookstore, you can give it a, you can give it a miss. Who, whose letters are included? Only famous people. That's another well, yes, problem I, know, I have but, with it. Only famous people. But... Uh, do you remember any of the people? Oh, well, in, in the, you know, when you get to the 19th century and, and the 20th century, it's all the usual suspects. D.H. Lawrence, uh, George Bernard Shaw, Virginia Woolf. Or earlier than that, it's John Evelyn and Samuel Pepys and whatnot. It's, it, mm -hmm. it, there, we, have, we have lots and lots of correspondence that this guy doesn't even touch on. It, it struck me as the type of letter anthology that you could make from other letter anthologies without doing any work on your own. Oh, so it was okay. a pretty good disappointment. That is that was frustrating in that way. The second, the other book that I want to show was frustrating in a very different way. I don't know if this is going to jog any memories for you. This is by uh, Fletcher Knebel and Charles Bailey, who was from Boston, uh, and it's Seven Days in May, uh, which was made oh, into a movie. It. With, uh, but it, it, it was a book first, and the book was a bestseller back in 1960 or something like that. Okay. And it's the story of uh, a charismatic. Uh, Secretary of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who 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 is plotting to overthrow the, the civilian government of the United States, he has a there's a weak, uh, wishy washy president whose uh, Gallup opinion ratings are in the twenties, his approval ratings are really low. He doesn't he's not a, a fierce charismatic figure himself, and gradually in the course of the novel, the he becomes aware of the plot, and he and his trusted advisors figure out what to do about it. They assemble a bunch of evidence against the Secretary of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And then the president calls him in for a one-on-one -on -one meeting in the climactic scene of the novel. Mm -hmm. But before that, he lines up, the president lines up military people he can trust to go to the Pentagon to, to, uh, to seize control of the nuclear arsenal, to not launch a war with Russia, which is what this general wants to do. Okay. He, gets, he puts military people in place first. And there's a great scene where one of those military people is talking with the president and said, you, you have my complete cooperation. He says, you know, a lot of people always say this can't happen here. And I used to be one of those people. But now I realize it can happen anywhere. Uh, and 
I was, you know, a line like that in 2022 that just stops you in your tracks. Yeah. This was, yeah. this was, you know, proxy war in Southeast Asia. This was rising Cold War tension and the threat of nuclear war with, with the Soviet Union. So naturally, back then, these two authors thought if this is going to happen, it'll happen by the military. Their right. thoughts were on the military. And I'm sure it never right. crossed their mind that the roles would be reversed, right? Because that's what we live through. We live through the president of the United States in that one-on-one -on -one meeting at the end of the book, wanting to overthrow the government right. and General Milley saying, no, we're not going to do that. Absolutely not. That is, it, it was just so dystopian to read that scene and realize that I have lived, I read this when it came out and I, I've lived long enough to see this come true in reverse, in exact reverse. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was General Milley a year and a half ago who put out that, and that incredible statement out of nowhere, right. seemingly out of nowhere, who knows what he really knew, but put, put out that statement out of nowhere saying that the military does not involve itself in political aspects of the United States government. Clearly because he knew that Trump wanted my generals to keep him in power. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is the exact reverse. But you know, another thing I noticed, of course you don't, because you didn't know I was going to show you this. You have no idea what I'm talking about. You're not <laughs> interested anyway, but I'll only make one more point. There's one point that the president and that, that secondary general also make. Uh, which is that they both point out how big the military is. This was 1960. They point out that after World War II, the military, that during World War II, the military grew in size and that mm -hmm. after the war, it just stayed big. It just mm -hmm. kept getting bigger, which was, again, a looming concern in the news back then. And all I could think about was, you know, what if I could get Arthur Bailey, uh, Charles Bailey back alive and tell him the the pentagon the pentagon's budget in 1960 was the same amount of money that the department of agriculture uses on office supplies today <laughs> if you go back and tell him that you were worried about a big military you were worried about money our military is two trillion dollars a year and <laughs> we was, just accept it and we just accept it Yep, yep. yep, we just do. We accept it so much that even so-called progressive Democratic candidates will quibble over what social programs they want to cut to afford medic medical insurance for people instead of right. looking at all of the military stuff that would easily finance everything. Mm -hmm. so, so that was that was frustrating in a different way. It, this is full of 1960s slang. It's not a well-written book. But okay. it, it was it was entertaining. As the thriller goes, it was entertaining. And I had completely forgotten how effective that climax is. That, that climax, it's a weird thing. You expect a climax of a book like this to be, you know, guns or something. But instead, right. it's two men talking in the Oval Office. And right. I forgot how effective it was. And there's also a, a one last point. One last point. There's a beautiful moment where the president... The, the general is being so aggressive and so bluff and denying everything. There's a beautiful moment where the president thinks, ah, oh. he starts to collapse inside. And you as a reader are on the edge of your seat thinking, oh, you've been such a weak little water lily the whole of this book. You're not going to give in now when it's the most important thing you'll ever do. And he doesn't. He gets all the way to the bottom of his soul in that one moment and then realizes, I don't have to deal with this. I don't have to, to dicker with this guy. I'm the president. Mm -hmm. And he rebounds completely. He becomes a different man so that was that was at least was was really good but there you go i'm done <laughs> so what about you what no there was a oh there was a question i had there was a question i had for you was it about my abs no i know all about your abs <laughs> you don't sound impressed <laughs> you never sound impressed well, well you know <laughs> they're just they're just another part of my day you know <laughs> but i don't i don't remember what i was oh i should point out again for our viewers that although deb and i look like booktube's kindly grandparents we're, <laughs> we're actually very poor examples of, <laughs> don't don't hold us up <laughs> for those were those grandparents that you don't want to introduce anyone to <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah um, what about your books so the last time i spoke with you i was reading the death of jane lawrence and i and I was like, oh, I don't know how I feel about it yet. Well, I ended up really liking it a lot. Oh yeah? Yes. Um, it, was, it was very engaging. 
the end, I, I'm not even sure I understand the end. So if anyone has any hints as to what was going on at the end of that book, and it's a I would love it. I read it twice. I have a, I have kind of a, like a, like a very vague notions, like trying to set it all down. Cause the end is very, um, is is very otherworldly let's put it that way because i don't want to give away too spoil much it. you don't want to spoil no, it no, I don't, but is there no i don't want to spoil it element in the book that's not spoiling. oh it. yeah yeah okay. and that's what i loved about it like it, it really sucked you in and and the atmosphere was good the um i really cared about the characters i wanted to know more about because because it's, it's not set in our world um, it, it's set in, in kind of maybe, I don't know, a parallel world maybe, where there's been some sort of um, warfare and revolution going on in, a, in one part of the world and Jane or one city or, or area of the country maybe, I don't know. And Jane is from that area and she go, goes to a different area of the country. And I wanted to know the, the whole backstory of her childhood and her, her um, life in that, in that upheaval. Because we're given enough that we don't really, I guess, need to know more. But I wanted to know more because I cared about it. Um, now that was a much hyped new release when it came out. Did you, was this something you got from your library? It was, it was something I um, got through Overdrive. And when you get, so you get it, your electronic version of the book through Overdrive. I've never once tried it, even though you've championed it for years. I've never once tried it. But when, yeah, I love when it. you pick a book like that, an electronic version in Overdrive, is there a mm -hmm. weight? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I saw, I didn't hear any of the hype. I just saw the cover. The cover is really intriguing. And I read the little description in Overdrive and I thought, yeah, that sounds like something I'll like. So so I placed a hold and I had to wait a while for it. Mm. You know, yeah, I got, I got endless emails about it and a, um, a, a print copy of it that I might still have. If you want it, I, I might still have that back in Boston. It was, a, it was a, a convoluted, a convoluted thing because I dearly love the publicist and she was mm -hmm. clearly either wanted to, to give it an all the all pistons treatment or was told to do that. And I didn't review the thing. I didn't read it be because I was worried that I wouldn't like it. And that it would be bad for her if I didn't like it. I'm not sure you would like it. Um, because you and I have very different ideas about fiction. Sometimes. Like I'm much more fiction oriented, I, I think. And you're much more nonfiction. Yeah. And, um, and I don't think you read as critically as I do. I think you're willing to, to give the book a lot more leeway than I am if you're enjoying it. Probably, yeah. I mean, I do appreciate well-written things. Um, and, and there is a point where something, even if it has an interesting plot, if it's so badly written, I'm willing to just not, yeah. not give it the time of day. I'm not one of these people, like we used to work with someone um, who would rate almost everything on Goodreads with five stars. And when I would talk to this person about it, they would say, well, it was really good for what it, what I expected of it or what it was meant to do. And I'm like, I'm not like that. No. <laughs> it has to, five stars has to be good plot and good writing. Like it has to- Now, what about uh, the, the Dresden Files? Are you still working your way through them? I am. And during, and this week, so I finished the book. I, I just read um, The Mirror Cracked from Side to Side, the Agatha Christie book. And once again, whenever I read an Agatha Christie book, I have that moment of shock where I'm like, oh my God, what a racist, you know? Like yeah. I forget and I pick up something yeah. else and I come yeah. across a derogatory word and I'm like, oh my God, I can't yeah. believe that. Yeah, years ago, I picked up a, a pretty paperback copy of Lord Edgeware Dies and mm -hmm. it's, I was two pages in before I thought, oh, okay. All right, the queen of mystery definitely has feet of clay. <laughs> yeah, and, and so I, you know, and I, I try to give it the leeway of like, 
well, it was the 30s or the 20s or yeah, whatever. Yeah, but you very much it get the impression different. that it was her, too. It, I'm sorry, what? You get the impression it that was, it was her, too. I'm because sure there, it was. We have plenty of mysteries from her contemporaries who don't do that. Who don't do that, yes. I'm sure it was. But did you end um, up enjoying it anyway? I liked, yes, I liked the mystery part of it, and I liked the story. Uh, it was just every so often I'd come across a, a word or a description of someone and I'd be like, yeah. oh my God, Agatha, please. Like, <laughs> yeah. like if only I could go back and convince you not to put in those words. Yeah, um, I, I noticed though that though there are two unsavory elements to Agatha Christie that I noticed when I go back to her every time. One is the racism and the other is the meanness. She's so... It, her, her contempt for so many different kinds of people, not just racism, but girls of any kind. She hates women, <laughs> but, uh, but also, you know, social climbers, people who don't make lots mm -hmm. of money. <laughs> it's not just yeah, her characters that seethe with contempt for those people. It's her that seethe with contempt for those people. You just have to, you have to look around it. The one thing I don't understand, I'm sure you've met as many of these people as I have, but the, the mm -hmm. one thing I don't understand are the legion of Agatha Christie fans who just don't see any of that. They unconditionally love her. They don't think, if you, if they were listening to this, they'd say, what? What are you talking about? There's nothing like that there. That's that surprising. I don't, yeah, because... I don't see how you can miss it. No, how, how you could, exactly. Like you could, you could probably overlook maybe somebody being painted in a bad way you know, uh, socially, but when the word is there yeah. in black and white, right? like how can you just- And when, like, when it's clear that the author doesn't care that it's there, when it, yeah. Right, right. Um, when a character is using that word in reference to another character and there's no clap back. Right, no one says anything yeah. about it. When yeah. in, even in her own time, if people had used that same word in almost any circumstance, at least someone would have said, that's like a weird kind of language to use in this setting. Yeah, it's, yeah. But uh, so, but obviously your reaction to it wasn't bad enough to dissuade you from doing another Agatha Christie. You, no, you're no, You're not banning I, I enjoy... this author. You're not canceling Agatha, Agatha Christie. I'm not canceling her <laughs> um, <laughs> because I, I enjoy the mysteries. And I enjoy the plotting and, and um, So you know. what's next? What are you feeling like next? Well, so I sent you a, an email and I said, what should I read next? And I gave you two choices. One being the, Dres the next Dresden book and the other one oh, that's being- right. That's right. There was no comparison at all. <laughs> there was, and I can't so this is it. what I, this is what I'm currently reading. You're gonna love and it, I'm in, and I'm enjoying it. Oh, you're gonna love it. If ever there was a dead book, you're gonna love um, it. <laughs> oh, amazing! So, I've read it already. I mean, they're not. It's not, you know, Schopenhauer, but it's yeah, totally it's, it's not earth shattering. It, no, it it's, it's just but totally it's fun. Important. It's fun so far, and it's what was that tag appealing. on it? That, oh, I was gonna send you a photo. You're of not that telling tag. me. Please don't tell me that's the book barn. No, it's a it's an old Barnes and Noble tag. Remember oh, when we had yes, in the downtown <laughs> store? Well, I wasn't there at the time. I was only a shopper in the downtown store, and you you just had endless tables on every floor. Yes. Of bargain yes. books. Of bargain books, we had an enormous remainder traffic. It um, did really well. Customers would clean us out of stuff. Yeah, it, it was. Was it? Almost the entire first floor. Almost the entire first floor. The walls were new retail, but the, all the trestle tables were remainders of one kind. And of, all the, the islands were remainders of one kind or another. And there were even tables upstairs. Yep. Sometimes. Of, yeah. of remainders. So this I paid three ninety eight for. <laughs> um, back in the days where Barnes and Noble sale uh, remainder stickers were just these little green tags. Yes. And we, well, before that, we used to put stickers on all the books. Back in the days when our motto was, if you paid full price for it, you didn't get it at Barnes & Noble. And wasn't everything like 10% off? 10%, sometimes more than that. 10%, 20%, it varied, varied depending on what you were buying. Uh, but it was, the, the motto was, you don't come in here and pay full price. We saw that change, didn't we? 
<laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> no, if anything, I mean, they never made it a motto, but if, if they had made it a motto, the motto would have become, if you paid full price for it, then you're not a member. Would you like to be a member? <laughs> How about if that's the only thing I talk about for the next 20 minutes? Do you want to be a member? <laughs> How about your little kids? Do they each want a membership card? <laughs> Memberships make great gifts. They make great gifts, yes. yes. Every, everybody's saying the same thing. And at the end of the register line, there's a manager and their loaded gun is just below the counter so you can't <laughs> see it. <laughs> so everybody's sweating. Oh, they make great gifts. Oh, they'll, they'll surely pay off for you. <laughs> the oh my God. Tapping the counter. They've got the Luger right there below the oh god forbid if you just asked and then gave up oh yeah no yeah no you had to you had to push 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 i do want to mention one book that i really really enjoyed that's kind of an um it's a reprint of a 1936 mystery called the deadly dowager by edwin greenwood apparently a british author popular Where in this day you that you found this thing it was on overdrive <sighs> it was it and it's the only book i've been able to like find um by him he, he wrote i guess a handful of of mysteries in the day what was his really name again edwin greenwood greenwood is one name greenwood is the last name I always hesitate when I say it because I think Greenberg and then I have to, no, no, it's Greenwood. Was it good? It was, um, it was, it was good in a very British way. Um, it was, so the basic plot is, is, is the, the Dowager Earl, I think, um, has a grandson who will be, who is the new Earl and the family's kind of running low on money. And so she comes up with this plan to get all the relatives to take out in, to take out insurance, and um, with him as the beneficiary, and then they start dying. <laughs> they start just dying off under very strange circumstances. So we know from the very start that she's the one doing it, and she's got a she's got a little mousy um, companion who is so mistreated the whole time. She's, she, there are, uh, there's a basket full of relatives who are, you know, quirky British stereotype kind of. But when you, know, you say, when you say Dowager Earl, you mean Marchioness. Oh, it, right. So she's called, she's not called a Dowager Earl. I don't know Earl. what she, I don't know. I don't, I don't know the titles. I don't know British nobility, but she was married to the Earl okay. who died. And then her grandson inherits the, the title and becomes the new Earl. So she's the dowager or whatever the phrasing. That plot is very similar to what I have planned for you. Uh, um, well, now, you know, you can get my books at my wake, so you don't have to. <laughs> yeah, so maybe to. my motivation is gone now. <laughs> yeah, just just back out of U-Haul up to, yeah. the, to the place and... Because the only other motivation I would have for such a scheme would be your huge savings account. And I think we both know the story there. Yes, yes. <laughs> we were booksellers for long enough so that I know the story. There. <laughs> there's nothing. Yeah, there's nothing there. Books are it. Well, there uh, we and go. Just, that yeah. Was a, that was a wonderful Manatee Monday, regardless of the day. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you, before we sign off, I'm going to ask you the question I know they're all asking, which is when will you be back? But it's totally a question of this insomnia, right? yeah it's um you know we'll try again for for maybe next monday um right we don't all die in the snowstorm but oh that's right if we lose our internet when are you when are you planning on being back well i we had a tentative plan that bean and i would go back on saturday Ah. It wouldn't be any problem for the Vermont part of the travel, but I'm not going to have my host drive me into a blizzard. It looks like right. there might be a serious storm in Boston, even though it seems like Vermont won't get that much. So we might have to wait. And or we definitely will have to wait because there's definitely a storm of some kind that's going to happen on Saturday. But what, now I'm thinking the, the backup plan was, well, what if we will just go back on Sunday? 
But if, if Boston gets 40 inches of snow on Saturday, we won't be going back on Sunday. We won't be able to get to my front door. Now, remember a couple of years ago, a few years ago, where we had um, big, a big snowstorm and it shut down the subway for like months? Yes, but that I, I keep thinking of that all the time. But that was almost 10 years ago, believe it or not. That was 2013. Oh. <laughs> I think the same way. I always want to think it was. I would have said like maybe three or four years ago. Yeah, no. But, but no, but that was you're right. Epic. It was longer than it was that. Absolutely epic. It's unbelievable. Um, any idea how much snow that dumped on us? I think that winter was the record breaker. I think we we beat the previous the previous record was in the was ten years before that or twenty years before that in the early nineteen nineties. I think we beat it by a fraction of an inch, as measured at Logan Airport. Uh, but but for me that winter that winter of uh, late 2012, 2013, wasn't about the the overall height of snow. It was about the endless barrage of storms. You'd you'd have a big storm and no warm weather in between, so the snow didn't melt. And then five days later, two days later, you get another big storm. Whereas this, be this is going to, clearly going to be the only storm that we get this winter. So that winter, all I remember, well, one of the many things I remember actually is just how you couldn't even tell if it was just a snowbank or if there was a car underneath the snow. Yeah. It was yeah. that. And the sidewalks disappeared. Suddenly yeah. it was these huge oh, yeah. walls could, of snow on yeah. either side. It was only room for one person. Yes. You, you, you just, just prayed to, you didn't meet anyone on the sidewalk. Yeah. You just and had strangely, to once again, we're praying we don't meet anyone on the sidewalk. We don't have to get by, walk by anyone on the sidewalk. Where I am right now, there aren't any sidewalks. No. <laughs> so I don't have to worry about that. And no one would be out anyway because it's 15 degrees below zero. <laughs> oh, holy cow. Well, you can tell my room is, is cold. I've got my blanket. Um, this room is cold too, but uh, the heating unit makes a lot of noise. And I knew that I was going to be talking to you and you already make a lot of noise. So I didn't want both. Of them. I didn't want both of them going. Oh, so you, Oh, well, okay. I was going to say you made the right decision, but maybe not. Maybe not. Zoom chatting know. with you is never the right decision. No. <laughs> but I keep doing it anyway. <laughs> but we'll, we'll, let's oh. wrap up this conversation and I will pester you with JPEGs of pornography to get you back on Monday. I will pester you to come back on Monday, provided we both have the internet. And and BookTube, you know what the porn's gonna be like. <laughs> it's gonna be pictures of Steve rolling around on a mound of books. Yeah, it's not very imaginative, but it's all they dream about. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, wave goodbye, Mrs. D. All right, and Mr. I'll stop D. the recording. All right.